Hey everybody, uh, Mr. Musak, trying this one more time for you guys, uh, looking at World War I and looking and seeing how things get started, what things happened during uh, the First World War. Uh, in class on Tuesday, we're talking about what causes a war. We've read a little bit about uh, the first topic, uh, which is uh, nationalism. We got it with a video uh, uh, about uh, the Black Hand and the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. We're Austria Hungary being a big country has a lot of different uh, ethnic groups in it, and they want freedom. Serbs being one of those in Bosnia, they want to get freedom from Austria-Hungary. Other groups involved, too, Poles, Slavs, etc., all have their own country. We're going to see on Tuesday uh, that rivalry is a big part of it, too, that countries want to rivalry, have rivalries, rivalries with each other and want to acquire more land, uh, military, industry, all those kind of things. Also, an arms race is happening on where countries are building bigger, bigger armies, bigger, bigger weapons including bigger ships, uh, more guns, all those kind of things. Next was the idea of imperialism we talked about already. Uh, these countries have uh, imperial possessions in Africa and Asia and want to continue to hold those. And lastly, the idea of alliances. We'll talk about that as well as countries are set up to protect each other. And uh, we see two big alliances develop, the uh, Triple Entente between France, Great Britain, and Russia, as well as the Triple Alliance of Central Powers between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And so... So we have basically had this whole thing set up in Europe. Um, it's like a big powder keg, just waiting for an explosion to happen. As we saw in class on Monday, that explosion, that spark, to set that explosion up was the assassination of our Archduke Ferdinand. So here is uh, our setup here. Here's little Serbia right here where Mouse is. Here's Austria-Hungary. And uh, essentially, Serbia had received independence very, very early in the 1900s from Austria-Hungary. Uh, but there are still many, many ethnic Serbs living in Austria-Hungary, in an area called Bosnia, this little area right here next to Serbia. And uh, basically, a lot of people there wanted to get their independence. They had uh, tried to independence earlier than that. They were put down violently by the Austria-Hungarian uh, re uh, regime, the people who ruled the, the, the area, and wanted to basically make that part of Bosnia part of Serbia. Uh, essentially, a nationalistic terrorist group was formed called the Black Hand, and they wanted to force... Austria-Hungary to put Bosnia as part of Serbia, um, even though the army was trying to keep them down and make sure everything was under control uh, that way. And here's this black hand group led by this guy named, uh, one of the leaders of this guy named Gabrielo Princep. He was uh, 19 years old, honestly. And uh, they wanted to get freedom of Serbian land by being Bosnia from Austria-Hungary. A lot of these are very young men, uh, between the ages of 19, 17, and say 28, 29. Um, a lot of them, like Prince up here, had tuberculosis, a disease of the lungs that was terminal. It, there was no cure for this time. Uh, now there's cures now. But at the time, if you had to PB or tuberculosis, it was basically a death sentence. His idea was to, you know, send a message to Austria-Hungary uh, by assassinating the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And so basically the story goes, we saw in the video, um, Franz Ferdinand, he was the, uh, the nephew of King Franz Joseph, says son here, we'll fix that. Uh, he was the nephew of uh, Franz Joseph, and uh, he actually and he uh, was the next in line uh, for the throne as well. Uh, so he was touring the uh, city of Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia, uh, in uh, uh, in Austria Hungary. And he brought his wife along as a present. She had never gotten to travel with him before because she was of a lower birth status. Um, basically, the black handed prominent had wanted to assassinate him, uh, assassinate uh, Ferdinand. Uh, as a way to get their freedom, get what they want uh, in terms of everything. And they tried different assassination attempts until eventually uh, Franz Ferdinand's car stuck right in front of the real Prince of show in the movie, and he shoots him, along with uh, Sophie as well. And this really does set off the whole uh, First World War. Uh, in terms of the war, what happens next is almost kind of like a fight in the hallways what it comes down to being. Um, first off, after a month later, and Austria-Hungary proves that Serbia had provided the guns and bombs for his assassination. Uh, Austria-Hungary here decides to declare war on Serbia. And Russia, who shares a common Slavic background with Serbia, decides to uh, declare war on Austria-Hungary. Germany had previously signed an agreement that said they would back up Austria-Hungary if anything bad ever happens. Uh, Germany gives uh, Austria-Hungary this thing called a blank check. Basically, saying, we're going to back you up. We'll pay everything we need to pay to back you up against Russia. So Germany comes down the side of Austria-Hungary. Then, France and Great Britain decided to come in and back up Russia because they're allies as well. And lastly, the Ottoman Empire kind of jumps in the end uh, and joins up with Germany, Austria, Hungary for the central powers. It is honestly like a giant fight in the hall. I mean, your first little scrap starts between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Uh, you know, they start fighting, then 
Russia being Serbia's buddy jumps in, and then Germany being Austria-Hungary's buddy jumps in, and then France and Great Britain jump in being Russia's buddies, and Ottoman Empire jumps in being uh, Germany and uh, Hungary's buddies, and, and all of a sudden a little fight becomes a giant fight. And it's all because of the alliances that were set up in Europe. And here we have everything being set up here, the, uh, the Triple Alliance or the uh, Central Powers being Germany, Austria, and Ottoman Empire versus Great Britain, France, and Russia. And that's how everything kind of sets up to start the war off. Now, Germany and Austria Hungary go on the attack first. And the general in Germany is a guy named, by the name of Schlieffen. He invents what's called the Schlieffen Plan. The idea of the Schlieffen Plan is to attack France before Russia gets its troops together. Uh, they're worried about what's called a two front war. Russia on one side, France and Britain on the other side. And so Germany's idea is that we're going to start here. We're going to attack France, take it over, then get our troops back this way before Russia can get everything together. Uh, so here we have France and Britain. They mass their troops right here, the little spot where Germany and France meet. And the Germans on their side of the border. Uh, it's kind of like a, kind of a standoff, if you will. And all of a sudden the Germans go this way up through Belgium, who's neutral at this point, which is kind of a big deal, and sneak right into France this way. Um, it's a big deal because Belgium was neutral. Typically back then, neutral countries, you couldn't invade them, couldn't fight the war. And so um, Germany is kind of uh, put down because they invaded a neutral country, which was not okay at this point. Uh, the Germans pushed within 30 miles of Paris until the French and British were able to stop them at a place called the Marne. Uh, Marne's the river outside of Paris. And uh, it's a system of trenches to slow the Germans down and eventually stop the German advance uh, into France. Now, uh, this idea of trench warfare starts on the Western Front. Essentially, we'll go back to the slide here. Uh, we see trenches develop all throughout this part of France. And this trench warfare slows down uh, the German advance enough that Russia can slide in here and attack from this side. So essentially, Germany gets the two-front war that it never wanted to have. And ends up uh, kind of being the, in a way, the uh, the end all be all for Germany, Austria, Hungary, kind of a slow uh, stay at the end. But on the Western Front, you have this stalemate between these trenches, where both sides of these trenches, uh, they're eight, ten feet deep, and usually you have three of them. You have the, the front trench here, uh, you have, and going back, you have trenches going back of a reserve trench that guys can move up in. And I'll show you some pictures of the trenches here as we scroll down. Uh, left in the trenches was not fun, it was not good. Uh, it was muddy when the rains came. They were filled with water and mud. It was cold. A lot of times you're always wet. Uh, you weren't, you have a lot of waterproof clothing yet. A lot of times you're wearing cotton or wearing canvas, wearing wool maybe. Um, there's a disease called trench foot. If your feet got too wet, they could develop bacteria and start eating your feet. It was really gross. Uh, rats lived in there. And essentially you'd be looking across the other direction, maybe a hundred yards across the other trenches taking a shot at each other. Uh, but this did slow down. The German advanced enough that you had that two-front war start. Uh, here's actually what the trenches look like today. You can tour them, look at them. Here's what that same trench looked like uh, in World War One. The stark difference to see how things look that way. And now we see kind of what the trenches were. Uh, in between the trenches was called no man's land. Uh, usually 100 yards, maybe a little more. Um, basically, it was a land that you tried to cross, attack the other trench. It was full of landmines, barbed wire, razor wire, all these kind of things it was hit with. And you set your soldiers over the top of the trench to go attack the other trench. Uh, and you try to get to that trench before you get shot. Um, a lot of times they use the artillery, big guns to soften the trenches first. And then you run, try to run to the other trench, get across this no man's land without being blown up or shot at. A lot of times battles will be fought over 30, 40, 50 yards of uh, territory at a time. I clicked the link here. I think to a video game you want to play. It kind of shows this idea of trench warfare. Uh, and check that video. And check that game out. Play. It's kind of fun. Um, so interesting to look at. Now, one of the things that is no man's man were landmines uh, developed this time as a way to you know underground bomb. You would your pressure your foot triggers a mine and it will blow up and take your leg with it. It's really dangerous. Used throughout the 1970s, uh, from World War One up to the 1970s. They're still alive around today in Afghanistan, Africa. In other areas of the world, and it still causes a lot of trouble yet today. Another new invention that came out this time was a machine gun. Um, machine guns were so dangerous at the time because uh, they could cover essentially an entire trench. As these guys are going across these trenches, uh, machine guns just could take out everybody. They could fire for 500 bullets at a time, and two or three in a trench could defend an entire attack. Um, kind of see the machine guns would feed the bullets in a belt here. A lot of times these uh, barrels here. Had a water jacket on to keep them cool because they'd fire so many guns the barrels would honestly get red hot. 
you change the barrel out, and you keep shooting. Besides, um, a really good example is the Battle of the Somme. We'll talk about Battle of the Somme in class. So basically, British soldiers rushed German trenches over and over and over and over, and basically ran into machine gun fire. Within a month or so, the Battle of the Somme took uh, over 500,000 British are dead in this one battle. Uh, it is just the key devastating impact of machine gun in World War One. The other thing was poison gas. Uh, German scientists are looking at using poison gas as a way to attack uh, enemy trenches. So either they would open up canisters of the gas, let it float over the trench, or they would launch artillery shells full of gas into the, uh, the opposing trenches. Uh, they use chlorine, which you have in pools today. It burns the eyes, it burns the lungs. I heard a lot of people that way. Or something called mustard gas, uh, which was a blister agent. It would uh, splash on people and burn the skin. Eventually, you create gas masks, which we're trying in class to uh, stop against that. They use uh, charcoal filters to try to filter up the gas, and so it wouldn't harm the person wearing the gas mask. The other thing were airplanes. Uh, airplanes are a pretty new, pretty new invention. They have been around since 1903. Uh, originally, they used for reconnaissance. They'd fly airplanes up, take pictures of the battlefield down below. And eventually, these pilots start shooting at each other, start uh, dropping bombs in the trenches, put machine guns on the planes, and become a huge part of, of the war over time. They also had artillery guns, uh, big guns that sent explosive shells to the other trenches. Honestly, more guys got hurt from artillery than anything else during the war uh, because they could attack the trenches from really, really far away. Uh, they got really, really big guns this time. Some could shoot shells from miles away uh, to opposing trenches or even to opposing cities. Last thing were the tanks. Uh, tanks were basically the new, the new land ships. Uh, essentially a big armored tractor with guns on that could go across the trenches, go through the barbed wire, and take uh, the abuse of machine guns that people couldn't take. And so it allowed um, people to cross the trenches. By 1918, uh, they started using tanks uh, by the thousands of battles uh, from the British side and French side to move across the battlefield. Uh, the U.S. stayed neutral originally. Uh, they didn't want to fight a war where it was 3,000 you know, miles away. Uh, people did hear stories and saw footage of the war. They didn't want to deal with those issues. Also, the United States was making money off the war as well. They were shipping goods uh, to Britain. Uh, you know, tanks and war machines and airplanes, all those kind of things. And so the United States was actually profiting from this war in some cases. Uh, because of that, Germans started something called unrestricted submarine warfare. Essentially saying that German submarines, or U-boats if you will, uh, would attack any ship bringing stuff to Great Britain. It didn't matter if it was British or Allied or not. If it was flying U.S. flag and thought it was bringing stuff to Britain for the war, it could attack it. Uh, U-boats being submarines could not be seen, so they could attack things very, very easily either pop up and shoot uh, these ships with their guns or use torpedoes uh, to shoot the ships. And they operate these big wolf packs, essentially preying on these unarmed ships going across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, eventually, the U.S. does a convoy to kind of stop that. Uh, one ship that was pretty famous was called Lusitania. It was a British passenger ship that uh, was heading uh, off the coast of Ireland, and supposedly it was carrying arms to Britain. Um, so a British U-boat popped up, torpedoed it, and with one torpedo, the ship basically blew up and sunk uh, in a very, very short period of time. Took down almost 1,200 people with it, including 120 Americans. Uh, some people thought it would bring the United States into the war. Uh, a lot of people started protesting Germany because of Lusitania sinking. Uh, in the end, we learned Lusitania did have arms on it. They were probably carrying bullets or shells. And when a torpedo hit uh, the side of the ship, those other bullets and shells exploded as well, causing a really big explosion. Um, in, in fact, other ships, other uh, uh, U.S. ships were sunk too but didn't bring the United States into a war until, 19, until 1917. Our last little thing about this was a new type of injury that happened uh, during World War I. It was called shell shock. It's actually a new type of injury uh, due to shelling, uh, loud noise explosions that people would hear all the time as they were there. Um, it started mentally affect soldiers. They couldn't fight in the battle. They just couldn't move, couldn't fight, were freaking out, even though they didn't have any actual uh, physical damage to their bodies. Um, a lot of people had it. Br British soldiers, French, American, German, everybody had these kind of this idea called shell shock. And eventually you started having, uh, uh, you freak out and have flashbacks, uh, a lot of combat stress, uh, because you're in the trenches, uh, being exposed to combat all the time. Uh, today we call it PTSD or post traumatic stress syndrome that, uh, soldiers, even soldiers today still have to deal with. And it really affected soldiers too when they, when they returned home. Uh, they might re react to sounds or loud bangs, fireworks. They really throw them off. As to, uh, as to try to react with themselves to daily life. Guys, these notes are due on Wednesday. You'll notice I cut a few things out from your note sheet. Just skip over them. We'll talk about them in class. Uh, it's going to give you some good background to what we're talking about in Wednesday, the Battle of Assam, as well as maybe we'll have a little trench war for our own here in class. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. Please make sure you're good for Wednesday. Uh, we'll see you guys then. Bye.